Before you start this episode, this is just a reminder that History Hack does have a Patreon account and a Ko-fi account as well. You can either register to subscribe and throw us a few quid every month, or simply buy us enough caffeine to continue through to the next episode. Because frankly, we run on fumes most of the time. Hello and welcome to today's History Hack. Uh, I have Chris with me today, and he's currently bleeding, but you don't need to know about that. But (laughs) he's smiling his head off because... For once, for all the mockery he takes on this podcast, Chris, we're going to talk about German victory today, aren't we? Oh, um, I did get thumped for this over the weekend because we're going to be talking about the siege of Paris. And Sam Jolly said to me, oh, it was really awful. And I said, well, if you'd surrendered quicker. But so moving on, <laughs> uh, we have David Lourde, who is historian and journalist who specialises in French history. His previous titles include uh, Napoleon's Master, A Life of Prince Talleyrand, Danton, Giant of the French Revolution, and The French Alphabet for Discerning Travellers. And he's here today to talk about his new book, A Time in Paris. So, David, welcome to History Hack. How are you doing? I'm in Paris. Paris is fine. So this is really interesting for both people, nerds like Sam, as you were talking about, who are interested in the Napoleonic period, and nerds like me, who go forward and do World War I, because... um, this is a big one in between. So I think we should just drive straight in, shouldn't we, Chris? On the yeah. 19th of September, 1870, the Prussian-led army begins to besiege Paris. But why are they at war with France? How have they even got to this point? Well, the root cause of the uh, of the war is uh, German unification, which uh, Bismarck was busily trying to uh, achieve. Uh, the actual the spark for the war was uh, almost ludicrous. Um, it uh, came from the throne of Spain, which was vacant at the time. Uh, Queen Isabella had been dethroned, and they were looking for a new um, uh, a new candidate. Um, and uh, Prussia's King Wilhelm put forward a candidate, a prince of the Hohenzollern line. Um, and this raised uh, hackles all around Europe. Uh, so uh, pretty soon he publicly uh, withdrew the candidacy. But this wasn't enough for France, which was very much against the idea of German unification or anything to strengthen uh, Prussia. Um, and uh, Emperor William, uh, Emperor, I'm sorry, not William, Emperor Napoleon III of France uh demanded from Wil- Wilhelm of Prussia a formal uh denial of that he would ever or anybody from his line would ever seek the Spanish throne. Uh what happened was that an ambassador was sent from uh Paris to talk to uh Wilhelm. Wilhelm was taking the waters at the moment at uh, the spa of Ems in on the Moselle River, and the ambassador came panting up to him and um, and said, "Look, um, you've got to you've got to uh, uh, agree to this demand from my emperor. Uh, will you do it?" And um, uh, Wilhelm said, "Well, look, I've already publicly uh, renounced this. Um, that's quite enough. So that's that." Um, a telegram was written by the court scribes and sent to Berlin on the meeting, and it got in, uh, it was a, a fairly inoffensive diplomatic uh, telegram. Wilhelm had been very um, courteous with the ambassador. Uh, Bismarck got hold of this uh, telegram, put his pen to it, and by the time he'd finished rewriting it, doctoring it, um, it was a uh, an intolerable insult to um, Prussia, and a sharp rebuke for um, uh, for uh, France and for uh, Emperor Napoleon. Um, he knew, Bismarck knew that this was going to goad um, uh, the French Empire into some kind of uh, quick response. He was a fairly simple man, uh, the um, uh, Emperor uh, Napoleon, um, but very touchy, and um, two days later, he did respond. He declared war on Prussia. Uh, so that was the uh, almost 
uh, <laughs> petty fogging uh, reason for war. But the real the, the real re- reason, as I said at the beginning, was uh, this business of uh, German unification. Much like the uh, Second Schleswig Holstein War goes very very well for Prussia, doesn't it? Well, the war the war went. Uh, there was uh, immediately war was declared. There was uh, the battles started raging on the in the Rhineland between the two armies, the Imperial French Army, which was uh, had a great reputation, and uh, the Prussian Army, which had an even greater reputation because they'd just defeated the uh, Austria and um, the Habsburg Empire um, in battle four years before, um, and um, and so. Uh, the warring was pretty savage, colossal uh, losses on both sides. Until suddenly, um, it became it came as a almost as a, as a surprise to both sides. The French army collapsed uh, one day at um, um, Sedan, Sedan on the border on the eastern border of France. French army collapsed. Wilhelm himself was taken, uh, sorry, um, Napoleon himself, the emperor, was taken prisoner. The entire French army was taken prisoner and they were all shipped off to Germany. Uh, and this was when um, the Prussians knew that uh, to defeat France, um, it meant not only winning a war in battle on the, uh, East, on the Eastern Front, you had to take Paris. And so they marched on Paris immediately after Sedan. Can I ask, it's not in the list of questions, but we do this all the time on History Hack, what is Paris's initial reaction to being under siege? Because I know in World War One they're kind of, because of this, they're preparing for it and they're like, oh God, not again. But in 1870, is it something they've got any experience of? Are they, do they know what to do? Um, well, Funnily enough, they were very buoyant. The, the popular mood was uh, almost uh, exultant. Um, Paris was, um, let's remember, Paris was the biggest city in the world in those days, in 1870. Uh, Paris was, uh, it's, it's sort of hard to realize, but Paris was at that time surrounded by stone ramparts, very high ramparts, totally surrounded by them. Um, and... Um, it had a population of uh, over two million. Uh, it had a reputation for being uh, a, a powerful uh, city, um, and um, so the population, the, pu- the public mood, was uh, was very buoyant. Um, however, um, the problem was that um, the Prussians had a, a force of about four hundred thousand men. This would be the biggest siege army ever assembled um, in Paris after the defeat of the Imperial Army um, there were only 75,000 um, trained troops troops of the line as they called them uh, plus another 100,000 um, young raw uh, reservists from the provinces and um, and this was actually more of a drawback in the beginning than an advantage for the uh, for the military commander in Paris. Um, they had the sons and fathers, the bakers and butchers and uh, um, candlestick makers who um, who were uh, made up the National Guard. Now the National Guard was uh, put together. Uh, they were paid if if they joined it, people were paid one franc fifty a day which wasn't too much even in those days. Um, and um, and they uh, had given plenty to drink. In fact, their barracks, most of the time, they were a pretty uh, uh, unruly mob. Uh, their barracks, most of the time, were the uh, Paris cafes rather than the uh, parade ground. Um, so it was, it was pretty un- uneven, but the population of Paris didn't take this in. Uh, they thought that it would be impossible to uh, assault Paris directly because of the of the walls, and um, they thought that uh, the Prussians would get soon get tired of it, which of course wasn't the case. In uh, in October, uh, there's a certain amount of excitement that um, captures the Parisian um, natives. What 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 drew them out to the streets? 
Well, there's a, a, um, Paris was um, sort of divided between a very uh, strong bourgeoisie uh, element and a working class. Um, the working class was had a uh, had a, a strong revolutionary uh, fringe to it, uh, more than a fringe really. Um, and they were called they called themselves the Reds, les Rouges. Um, <coughs> and uh, when Napoleon was uh, captured, the uh, Paris moderates, uh, the bourgeois, if you like, bourgeois republicans, proclaimed a republic, and that was the end of the French Empire. France was now a republic overnight. Um, the um, but this didn't go nearly far enough for the uh, revolutionaries in Paris. They wanted a complete uh, change of government. They wanted to have um, uh, somewhat based on what the revolution of 1789 had wanted. Those sort of things. And um, and there was a result in October. I think you may, you're, you're talking about this. In October there was a, a revolt against the uh, this moderate government that had taken charge. Um, it didn't work out on that day, although it might have done, um, because the military commander of Paris, we'll come to his name in a moment, uh, convinced them that, uh, first of all, um, OK, he said, you know, maybe we could have elections to, and that maybe we could get somewhere near to the things that you want. But first of all, we've got to uh, send the uh, the Prussians packing. We've got to... Uh, um, uh, ward them off and uh, so they agreed on the day they agreed to that and uh, there was a bit of peace in Paris for a time there were the um, um, the Paris of course was uh, totally uh, cut off from the world uh, the Prussians, the first thing the Prussians did was to cut communications which were, which was the telegraph line, uh, that was the only sort of means of uh, you know, immediate communications in those days um, and um, the, because there was the ring uh, of um, around Paris of the Prussian troops, um, nobody could get in or out. Paris, the, the 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 population of Paris, two million people, they were prisons, um, and uh, there was no food coming in. Um, the Prussians had decided instead of uh, attacking the city, uh, they would starve it out. And this was going to take quite a long time, and uh, it didn't suit Bismarck at all. Bismarck wanted a very quick result. The reason he wanted a quick result was that he was afraid that uh, um, the other European powers uh, who were standing neutral for the moment, and in particular Britain, um, would intervene. Uh, Nobody wanted Prussia to become too huge. Uh, for anybody to manage anymore. Um, and so he wanted the whole thing done quickly. He needed France to, uh, to uh, surrender. He wanted Paris to surrender before he could actually proclaim uh, the unification of Germany. Um, and so he didn't, this idea of starving uh, Paris out wasn't what he wanted at all. He wanted to bring in big guns and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, do a, a direct assault. Um, and, and that didn't happen. There was, the first month went by, sweltering heat. Paris, there was a, there was a, um, uh, an Indian summer like never before. Uh, I mean, very, very hot. Uh, for the first month, also went into the second month, then some rains came, and then winter came along, and it turned out to be the uh, the harshest winter that they'd known for a 100 years. The uh, temperature went down to minus 15 uh, centigrade, the, the Seine froze over. Um, so it was, things were hard in Paris, it was a real ordeal. There was no food, um, and... Um, and uh, um, all they had was this confidence, uh, which remained, this sort of buoyancy, uh, remained that they could somehow win this thing. I should ask as well, when, so when do they go from utter buoyancy to a point when there's no food, they're starving hungry, um, they're still bullish, but morale must surely take a massive hit as this goes on. 
Um, yeah, the first, the um, morale, the first amongst the bourgeoisie uh, uh, was deflated. Um, but um, the, uh, the Reds wanted to, they could only pursue their revolution if they had the uh, the city to do it in and it was their city and it would only be their city if they drove the uh, if they tried to if they managed to drive the Prussians off um, which they didn't do either um, so um, it did uh, this sort of confidence of the city did begin to die away but it was still there for some um, and they tried uh, various um, breakouts, military breakouts, uh, none of which worked. Um, there was a very, very big one in uh, January in, the, in this uh, incredible cold uh, when they broke out uh, with about 100,000 men and they even used the, uh, some of the, um, <clears throat> uh, the National Guard, the, the uh, bakers and butchers for this. Um, and um, they broke out in the East across the river Marne, uh, where the Marne comes into, joins Paris, just uh, just uh, outside the walls. They broke up. And this uh, battle went on for five days before finally the uh, the uh, Prussians um, uh, managed to uh, break the, uh, stop the breakout and send them back into Paris. And that was pretty well the end of, uh, of the hopes that they had, um, except that they simply didn't surrender until food actually did run out completely. Uh, they'd had, a, a, early on, they'd had quite a lot of flour in the city to make bread, you know, the very basic foods. Um, but that had run out uh, fairly early on, and they were, they had um, bread, uh, which was a kind of, it was it was a substitute bread, um, which was a sort of dross, with mixed with cotton and uh, stuff like that, and everybody hated it, but they had to uh, eat it. Um, and, you know, the legend of Paris at the time, it's more than legend, it actually happened, was that they were eating sewer rats and stray dogs and, and of course, the... Uh, the animals from the zoo. There was a bit, Paris had a big zoo at the time with elephants and uh, elephants provided quite a lot of meat. Well, uh, one thing, uh, if, if I might just uh, say one thing that we haven't uh, said. Of course, we divert down rabbit holes all of the time. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the reason why um, France and Germany were so much at loggerheads over German unification was that... Um, uh, it meant to unify Germany. Prussia was, of course, a, the largest part of these German lands. And there was a string of South German states, which um, Bismarck had to bring in to a unified Germany to do the, to, to do the job. This was his life's work. Um, France uh, regarded herself as a sort of uh, godmother to the South German states, which included, uh, you know, pretty big uh, uh, provinces of, um, well, they were sovereign states, um, Bavaria, Saxony, uh, Baden, and they came right up to the border with France. So this was something that was um, uh, totally unacceptable to France, uh, this form of unification, which brought Prussia, the new uh, unified Germany right into uh, France's uh, frontiers. Um, that was, um, uh, you know, that was the uh, talking about the root cause of all this. That was uh, why they went to war over the future of the uh, South German states as part of Germany, if Bismarck got his way or not, if the front, if the French got their way. I've mentioned already about the tension between um, uh, Wilhelm and um, Bismarck. How did their relationship develop throughout the siege, and especially, and then again with Moltke the Elder as well? Well, they had um, Moltke and uh, sorry, uh, Bismarck and uh, Wilhelm had a very very intimate relationship, uh, and this lasted throughout the real. Uh, uh, struggle was as to what uh, the siege should be doing uh, was between 
Bismarck and von Mol- Helmut von Molke, who was the venerable uh, head of the uh, Prussian army, Marshal von Molke. Um, and um, he was the one who didn't want to um, uh, make a direct assault on Paris. He thought it was too risky and that it would waste too many of his men and that it might not even work. Um, whereas um, Bismarck, for reasons that you know we've said, the, the, he was worried about intervention, worried that uh, <coughs> if he didn't do it quickly, well, then the whole thing could backfire. Um, so there was this... Uh, uh, confrontation between the two um, and um, poor Wilhelm uh, had to take the side of uh, Moltke in this because uh, when Prussia went to war uh, the the one who, the man who counted, the man who called the shots was the military commander uh, Bismarck was the man who called the shots in Germany in all domestic matters he was master of Germany but when battle commenced uh, he had no uh, so he was extremely frustrated over this finally um, as um, winter came um, and the fourth month uh, was halfway through they were finishing the fourth month of the siege wasn't getting anywhere um, Bismarck did uh, convince um, Moltke to bring in uh, the latest huge uh, uh, cannon uh, weaponry from uh, from Germany. Uh, it was the, the these were the Krupp cannons uh, made in uh, in the Ruhr. Uh, these were the biggest guns around. Um, and um, Moltke did agree to bombard Paris uh, in the end. Uh, so there was a combination of this bombardment of Paris and sheer hunger which uh, forced the surrender in the end, which didn't come until into the fifth fifth month. It was an amazing ordeal for the population. What did, is it Trossu discover one wet morning in November, and how did he try and resolve the situation? Uh, Trossu, yes, this was the name of the military uh, governor of Paris, the man who, the, the defender, um, uh, this was another, this was uh, a, a true uh, revolt um, in Paris, carried out by the, the Reds. Um, um, they didn't think that um, Toshi was doing his job. And in a way, uh, he wasn't, because uh, Toshi was convinced that uh, the Russians were invincible. Um, he looked at his own men and he thought they were a rabble, mainly a rabble. He looked at the Prussians, they were seasoned in war. Um, and so, uh, he was probably the least confident, the least, uh, buoyant <laughs> of all the population of Paris at the time. Um, so, um, this was, uh, uh, another and much more serious revolt by the Reds in Paris to try and take over the government. Um, this time he actually he he put it down by calling in uh, guardsmen from uh, bourgeois districts um, who were loyal to the moderate republican government um, and uh, they came in there wasn't a, a battle between them it, there was just a standoff briefly and the uh, and the red um, guards battalions uh, withdrew again and that was probably the most uh, successful moment in uh, Trochu's whole uh, uh, command when he managed to stop the revolts when he was uh, um, when he was uh, the uh, military governor. In a way, he's being besieged by the air externally and internally, which is not a position anyone wants to be in. Exactly. Uh, uh, poor, I say poor uh, Troshu because uh, he was also um, uh, ridiculed uh, as time went on and uh, he wasn't able to do anything. People early on thought that, uh, believed that Troshu had a secret plan uh, to uh, ward off the Prussians. Of course he didn't. It was just uh, uh, sort of Paris vain glory, the froth, what he called the froth of public opinion. Uh, he didn't have a plan. Uh, he thought that if the Prussians did uh, do a direct, uh, make a direct assault on the city, 
uh, it would be a horrible bloodbath, but um, probably they would, it, it would, you know, perhaps be the only way that they could beat the Prussians you know, on the streets of Paris because they had barricades throughout the city. Um, remember also that uh, uh, Paris, um, apart from being the biggest city in the world at this time, had been completely modernized and renovated uh, in beauty too. It was a beautiful city uh, by uh, Hausmann, Baron Hausmann, the architect who completely remodeled uh, Paris, the, the sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the medi- fetid medieval, medieval alleys that were, were there before. Um, and this made it much easier within the city to defend because they could put up, put up barricades uh, all, the, wow. all, the, all the new uh, avenues and boulevards. Um, after the uh, failure of the big breakout, Troshu, uh didn't resign, but he was pushed out by the uh, by the moderate Republicans. Um, you can't do it. Uh, we'll get somebody else to do it. And um, this was, in any case, um, a sort of signal for uh, surrendering and uh, capitulation, which happened in um, in uh, February, February of eighteen seventy one. What, what was the um, sorry? What was the Count of La Salle's plan? Well, I saw this uh, mention of La Salle. Uh, La Salle is a nobleman, um, and um, this is a no- my book is a novel. Uh, he is fictional, but he represents a certain class in Paris which was uh, 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 devastated by the fall of uh, the emperor, uh, and were actually quite uh, happy to see if it if it came about, would be quite happy to see the Prussians uh, defeat Paris and uh, and just restore order uh, in the capital. Uh, he thought that the revolu- revolutionists would take over. Um, and he is somebody who has his uh, sort of um, wonderful townhouse on the boulevard Saint-Germain, which was then not completely uh, finished. Um and um he is one of the people that um the hero of, of the book, if I may call him a hero, uh who is a, a young English gentleman uh of his Victorian uh rather conventional young man of Victorian uh, times, his times. Um he falls in love with a um uh, a radical uh young French girl who is pro-revolutionary, I mean, it's a, a completely unlikely match, but these things, this is, you know, part of the book, what can happen in times of war. Um, and uh, La Salle um, is, comes into the um, uh, this part, this story. Uh, he tries to um, uh, break out, he tries to lead a breakout um, to... Um, to sort of promote his own uh, military position. Um, he had been in the army, but uh, he was a po- more a politician. And to promote himself, uh, he led a breakout, um, which failed completely. Uh, in the breakout, the young Englishman was injured uh, quite badly, but not that badly uh, that it stopped him from uh, you know, carrying on through the novel. Um and um, eventually, uh, La Salle, uh, wanting to promote himself, uh, goes a step too far and uh, completely uh, covers himself in ridicule and, and commits suicide. Uh, Trochu uh, is actually quite pleased at this to get rid of such a, uh, a problem. He became, he, La Salle was a problem. The royalists were a problem in Paris. A smallish problem compared to the others, but still a problem. You've already mentioned uh, bringing up the new crop houses and this idea of starving the population out. How effective are these strategies that they're concerned about? Starvi- uh, starving Paris are, um, in the end, uh, very effective. Uh, over a long time, uh, Paris, uh, the resistance... Um, 
uh, they they managed to go without. Um, starvation was um, something that um, the Russian gen- the uh, Prussian generals uh, were not that happy about. They actually uh, they actually wanted to uh, attack. They wanted to humiliate Paris. They uh, they were still thinking back to the days of Napoleon Bonaparte, who'd run riot over Prussia, and they wanted revenge for that. Um, and so starving Paris out um, was not exactly their idea of, of revenge, but it was von Moltke's idea, because he was the man who was running the show and he called all the shots. So, uh, yes, um, so, how did starvation um, work? Uh, it, it certainly worked in the end, but it needed big guns to help it along. Yeah. How bad was the bombardment uh, for the civilians in Paris? The bombardment was pretty intense over over several weeks. Um, they brought up these big guns. They managed to uh, bring them up within about a mile or less than a mile of Paris, and they had a pretty they had a huge range. They could still only reach southern Paris up to the up to the River Seine, they were positioned along the southern rim of the of, of the of the ramparts, um, and um, and it was uh, you know hugely demoralising for the people to see the uh, the monuments and the, the work of um, you know craftsmen through the centuries uh, being shattered, um, but. Um, the shells uh, in those days, they didn't, uh, this was before the days of dynamite. Uh, dynamite actually had been invented. Uh, and um, it, the Prussians thought of using it, but decided against it because they thought it would blow up in their faces. Um, nobody knew how it worked. Um, and um, so the shells in those days, uh, what they did, um, they, they hit a building and they made a hole in the building. They didn't uh, bring the whole thing down. Um, so the damage was uh, to the eye uh, was uh, appalling, incredibly disheartening uh, for the Parisians, but actually not that great in terms of destruction. But I'd say, but combined this combined with the 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 the, the larder now was empty. Empty, completely empty. And uh, so the two together uh, meant that uh, surrender was uh, the only thing that they could do. And what happened they then, uh, when, when they, um, uh, when Paris surrendered, um, the uh, Prussians still didn't uh, move in. They still, they just stayed outside and uh, they exacted their uh, armistice terms, which were uh, for the French. Uh, completely unacceptable. They had to accept it. Uh, they lost their two um, most, two of their most precious provinces, industrial Lorraine and uh, Alsace on the Rhine, uh, became part of the new uni- uh, unified Germany. Um, they celebrated the coming of the proclamation of the uh, unification of Germany in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles as a sort of uh, humiliation and insult to the uh, to the French. The Hall of Mirrors at Versailles being the place, of course, where which was uh, you know glittering uh, uh, galleries in in um, in tribute to the Sun King Louis the Fourteenth and his uh, martial glories across the Rhine uh, in Germany, uh, way way back, of course. Uh, in, in 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 history, not that far back, but a long way back. No. Um, so these um, the um, the French were, to use a common term, totally gutted by what mm. happened. Um, there was uh, the French. The um, Bismarck uh, said, "Well, you better have elections now." For the whole of, of France, because this no longer Paris does no longer represents the whole of France. Elections were held. Uh, there was um, a completely right wing uh, majority formed, and the, and Paris refused to accept the new government. The revolutionaries then 
uh, took did finally take power after the um, Prussians left. Uh, it was a pretty uh, short-lived um, government called the Commune uh, in um, uh, memory of the Commune of 1789, the French Revolution. Um, and they wanted more or less the same revolutionary things that had gone before. Um, uh, but this this Commune was um, was then... Uh, in conflict with the this new very right wing French government from the provinces, there was civil war. Uh, the commune was uh, crushed. Uh, Twenty five thousand uh, and more mem- uh, revolutionaries, uh, Reds, were slaughtered. It was the most horrible time in French history, um, and therefore, um, this brings to the whole point uh, of, of what happened afterwards um, French grievances against mm-hmm. Germany Prussia were immense they yep. ran very, very very deep um, they what they what they needed uh, over the years the more this uh, came up they needed revenge uh, to to become their the, the nation that they had uh, always felt themselves to be. They needed revenge. It came, didn't come for quite a long time. Um, uh, Paris, France prospered again gradually after the uh, defeat, after the defeat by the Prussians. Um, there came the, um, the Belle Epoque, which was a pretty glittering period for, for France. And then um, one thing and another, they came World War One. Now, uh, my thesis is, and uh, not everybody agrees with this, was that uh, the fundamental source for World War One was this French desire for revenge, the writing of grievances, getting back uh, Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, um, and of course, uh, since World War One led to World War Two, um, one could say that um, I feel that what happened in 1870 was the source of so much of the, of the horror that happened. The horror that happened in the 20th century. Even Lenin um, uh, got into the act here. He. Um, uh, was inspired. He, he he talked of being inspired by the commune, the the revolutionary uh, set up, which briefly uh, reigned in Paris, uh, not because it had succeeded, but because in, in revolution, but because what it showed how how not to, uh, showed the things to avoid when you're doing revolution, and he and he used this as a model for the things to avoid. Uh, in the revolution of uh, the French uh, Russian Revolution, nineteen seventeen. David, thank you so much for coming on to give us a bit of an overview of the siege of Paris and the impact of the Franco-Prussian War. Your oh, well. book, A Time in Paris, is out now. Uh, we will put it in our History Hack bookshop so that you can buy it um, from us. That way, David gets his royalties, we get some cash, and Amazon get nothing because they're minted already. David, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org, forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section thank you so much for your continued support we really appreciate our listeners and supporters so make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book